my name is Stephen. If you haven't met me yet, um, I'm going to bring God's word to us today. Um, I'm really glad that you're here. Angelina's not here today. She's feeling a little unwell, so I'm just saving all the questions later. <laughs> She's at home. People more worried about Angelina than they are of me, but that's great. <laughs> um, I, I think often our approach to religion and, and being a Christian in Christianity is that we don't want God or, you know, who, whatever we might believe, you know, about God. We don't want God to make our life hard or harder. We want to make our life easier. And if I'm honest, that's really half the reason why I do anything in life, is to make my life easier. Uh, I, we, we, will, we invent gadgets and ways to make life easier. Uh, I, I make money to buy things to make my life easier. And we can carry that same mindset over into how we relate to God. Uh, we want to hear what we want to hear. We want to feel the way we want to feel. We want God to align with us because that is how we make our life easier when, when God aligns with what we want and tells us that we should feel how we feel and he agrees with us. And we get annoyed if he doesn't. Well, Christianity does give us some hard truths um, and, you know, it, it tells us if there is a God, then he, he's not interested in just, you know, floating around and being your little personal genie or guardian angel. Uh, he, he demands that you worship him and, and you live a life that obeys him and aligns with him. And that tells us that the way we think, the, uh, what we think is good for us and what we think we need may not actually be good for us. We might not be the ones that have ultimate control over what we have. And that means following God, being a Christian, is really hard work. Being a Christian is hard work. Following God, obeying God, and living a life that honors God is hard work. Because in so many ways, we're living a life that isn't about fulfilling what we think we want or what we think we need or what God says. So we're going to find out what encouragement the Bible has to offer for those, those of us who are finding it hard to follow Jesus and we're finding following Jesus hard work. So let's pray. Father, we come to your word and it's your word. We need your help by your spirit. Would you help us uh, hear and apply and honour you and, and fall in love with you a little bit more today. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, so, we're in the book of Philippians, and last week, Glenn reminded us, uh, Glenn told us this message of, of, Paul gave us this command that we should do nothing out of selfish ambition, um, but instead we should value others above ourselves. We should look to the interests of others and he gave us the example. Who was the example? Jesus was the example of that. So he gave us a command and he gives us an example. And he's going to do that again for us in these verses. He's going to give us a command and then he's going to give us an example of what that looks like. In verse 12, um, Paul starts off by saying with the word therefore. So we need to remember when there's a word, when the word therefore means you should read whatever's coming in light of what we just read. So, if we read verse 12, and it says, Therefore, um, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling, we could read it as, since you've just heard about Jesus' example of humility, therefore, you should now work out your salvation with fear and trembling. So you've just heard about Jesus, now in light of what you know Jesus has done, this is how you should respond. This is my command to you, knowing what Jesus has done for you, you should continue to work out your salvation in fear and trembling. So here's the hard truth right here. Paul is saying that work, that uh, being a Christian 
having heard about Jesus and then living it out, you have to work at it. That's the word he chooses to use. You have to work at your salvation. Work out your salvation. Uh, Paul thinks it's hard work to follow Jesus. To follow Jesus, you're going to have to put in some effort. Uh, if we look down in verse 16 and 17, and uh, it's on the screen, I want us to notice how Paul describes following Jesus. He says, I'll be able to boast on the day of Christ that I did not run or labor in vain. So, so he describes his journey as a Christian as, as like running a race that's tiring and as labor. <laughs> it's hard work. And then he says, in verse 17, even if I am being poured out like a drink, so the image of, of being poured out like a drink, being poured out from a cup, even if I'm being poured out like a drink offering on the sacrifice and service coming from your faith. So Paul is saying following God can really feel like hard work. Paul isn't afraid to admit that following Jesus is tough it can feel really tough he's not afraid to admit it and neither should we you might be finding it tough to honor god in your life in in the way you think in the way you live in the way you feel you might find it tough to honor god you might find it tough to honor god when you're hanging out with your friends maybe from high school or, or, or from work, and they're not Christian, and, and they do things on a Friday night that's not really what a Christian should do, but you find it tough to navigate that, how to hang out with these guys and, and to enjoy their presence and have them enjoy you, and yet you know there are things that you shouldn't do. You might be finding it hard to honour God and, and finding it tough to follow God, um, in your relationships, in your marriage, you know, when you're arguing with your partner, or when you're angry at your kids, you might find it tough. How do I, how do I honor God and follow God here? You might find it hard to honor God and trust Him when bad things happen in your life, and, and you're like, God, this is really bad. Why would God, if he loves me, why would he let this happen to me? You might find that really tough. If you found it at some point in your life or in this past week hard to love your enemy, if you found it hard to control your anger, if you found it hard to speak to your lesbian or gay friend about what the Bible says, then you are absolutely right. It is hard. Being a Christian and following Jesus and obeying his commands is tough. It's hard. But Paul says, even though following Jesus is tough, we can rejoice. We should rejoice. Don't rejoice because life is easy or following God is easy. Rejoice even though following Jesus is hard because he says what you're going through is not in vain. Do you see that? I do not run or labor in vain. What you're going through is not in vain. See, life without God is hard as well. And life with God may be even harder. But if you have God, your suffering and sh- and hardship and difficulty has meaning. Jesus is coming back. The day of the Lord is coming. So work hard in working out your salvation because at the end of the day, it will not be in vain. Now, Paul, obviously, he's not saying work hard so that God can love you. You don't have to work hard so that you're accepted by God. Paul is saying, work hard because you can't approach being a Christian or or Christianity as a sort of, you know, look, I got baptized once, 
and move on with your life or I went to church the other week and move on with your life or I mean even I'm in the leadership team I, I, I'm serving in music or, or some other thing and you know I'm a great Christian role model and then just move on with your life Paul is saying none of that means anything if you aren't continuing to work out your salvation And for us to continue, to even want to continue to work out our salvation, even though it's tough, we have to have a certain attitude. And that attitude, Paul says, is an attitude of fear and trembling. Work out your, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Let me just put that back up. Now, fear and trembling the wrong way to take this fear and trembling is to sort of say, okay, when we're before God, we need to sort of like hide in the corner and cower and, and, you know, wet our pants, sort of fear and trembling. This isn't that sort of fear and trembling. This is a sort of fear and trembling that that doesn't make us shrink away, but actually uh, it it gives us strength and courage and and it it gives us this mindset and, and to carry on and power to carry on. Fear and trembling before God is a fear and trembling of awe. If we, I, w- I really want to go and see the Grand Canyon one day. I don't know if you have. But I've heard that when, um, when, when you stand in front of something as awesome and big in nature like the Grand Canyon, you feel how, how massive and how grand the world is. And you just feel really small in comparison. And, and sometimes that really brings you back to reality and tells you, maybe I'm not the center of the universe. Maybe there is something bigger out there. Now, I really want to go and, and, and see that one day. But, I, I, but you can experience that even in a show. You go anywhere and you, if you just take a moment to look at the world around you, to look at nature to, to look at how awesome and beautiful even just a small plant might be, a flower might be, and you realize, wow, really? All that for this one little plant that no one might even look at, and you realize, man, I'm so small. I'm an insignificant part of this world. You fear, you tremble, you're in awe because you realize there's something bigger out there. You are in awe of God. And, uh, and this fear and trembling, if you're in awe of God, it should give you courage. Um, you know, I'm, I'm scared of my dad. <laughs> you know? Um, uh, look, we can have fear of a loving and caring father, right? We can have a good fear uh, of the wrath or anger of a judge or a lawyer who, who knows what is right and who cares about justice. We can have a good fear of that. I can be afraid of my dad, but I can also respect him when he's angry at something that is wrong or evil, or unjust, I'm afraid, but I respect that. I can be afraid of this judge who who sees the worst of humanity every day in court, and he's angry, or she's angry, and and she hears what has been done to this child or to this innocent person, and they're angry, and you can feel it in the way that they're giving out the sentence, and you wouldn't want to be there. You wouldn't want to be that person. You fear it, but you also gain strength and courage because that anger is directed against what's wrong in the world. And that's the case with God, isn't it? God made every mountain, he made every valley. He is angry beyond imagination against everything that is evil and unjust and causes suffering. including us, because there's evil and injustice inside each of us. 
But he's, he says, look, I'm not far away. I'm not, I'm not an angry God that's going to sort of point a finger at you and say, you suck, um, you're done, you know, move on. He actually says, you're really evil, you're really bad, I'm very angry, but I'm going to come close to you. I'm going to come down to your level. And even more than that, he actually says, I'm going to come and dwell and live inside of you. If you look at verse 13, Paul says we should continue to work out our salvation with fear and trembling, not because we're scared that we might mess up and God doesn't love us anymore, but look, we should do it because this awesome, amazing, heavenly, powerful, almighty God is working in you to, fit, to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. God is working in you. I mean, that should make us pause for a second. God is working in you. God isn't over there. He, he, he's not sending you sort of, you know, warning emails, urgent, you need to do this and, you know, you're going to get fired and you, you're no longer going to be a welcome in his family because you haven't fixed it, you know, by the end of the day. He is working in you. He, he tells you, look, this is my standard and I'm going to work in you. You know, Paul talks about being a Christian as like running a race or labor and it's hard work and he's pouring, he's being poured out. But he's also saying, God is the one that gives him the strength to put one foot in front of the other. God is the one who gives him in his heart the motivation, the, the, the reason to run in the first place. God is the one who makes his heart pump and the blood flow for him to even run in the first place. You are running the race. You are going through tough times. You are going to find it difficult to be a Christian, but God is the one who is working in you. So let me ask you, do you struggle with sin? You can tell yourself this. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in, works in you to will and to act to fulfill his good purpose of presenting you holy and blameless. If you struggle with anxiety or worry, then maybe God is saying this, work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you to will and to act to fulfill his good purpose to give you everlasting peace. If you struggle with guilt, and maybe you just feel like you're, you're never good enough for God, maybe God is saying, work out your salvation with fear and trembling because it is God who works in you to will and to act to fulfill his good purpose of giving you the full assurance that you are saved by grace alone that you are no longer a slave to guilt or to sin, but you're a child of God. There's no greater assurance and no greater encouragement for us to live day by day than to know that God is working in us for his good purpose. So what can stop us from believing that? There's, you know, you wake up in the morning, all right, you remind yourself, okay, today... I, you know, God is, God is going to work in me and he's going to fulfill his good purpose in me. That's really great. What can stop us from holding on to that assurance? Paul says we should do everything without grumbling and arguing. Paul gives us this negative example. If you grumble, he's pretty much saying do everything without grumbling and arguing um, because if you do that, you know, you're gonna, it, it's going to hinder you. This is a roadblock from us having this assurance that God is working in us. And you might think, oh, I'm grumbling and arguing. Okay, like, that's not that bad. 
you can grumble, you can you know grumbling and arguing a little bit. You know, oh God, are you sure? You know, oh, I don't really like this. It doesn't sound as bad as I don't know, like murder or lying or why? Why is Paul saying the biggest obstacle for us to trusting in God is grumbling or arguing? Um, this is a reason why. In verse 15, he says, so that you may be, you should do everything without grumbling or arguing, so that you may become blameless and pure, and there's quotation marks, children of God without fault in a warped and crooked generation. Paul's taken that line from Deuteronomy, and uh, Deuteronomy chapter 32, and, this, and Moses is talking about it. So he's saying, and Moses is talking about Israel. He, he refers to Israel as a warped and crooked generation because they've actually been grumbling and arguing to God while they're in the wilderness. So the background is Israel, God has taken Israel. They've been, they've been slaves in Egypt for 400 years. God has miraculously taken Israel out of Egypt. And he's taken them through the desert and he's, he's going to take them into this promised land. And then they're at the doorstep. They're about to enter this promised land that's filled with blessing and rest. And, you know, God's going to go before them and they're going to have, have a land for themselves. They're not, no longer slaves. They're no longer going to wander in the desert without a home. And at the entrance to this new land, the Israelites start grumbling and arguing before God. I'm going to read a little bit from Deuteronomy, and um, this is from chapter 1, and this will give us a better idea of what's going on. Moses speaks to the Israelites. Moses is the, the leader of the Israelites. He speaks to them, and he says, But you, you meaning the Israelites, you were unwilling to go up. You rebelled against the command of the Lord your God. You grumbled, you see, you grumbled in your tents and said, the Lord hates us. So he brought us out of Egypt to deliver us into the hands of the Amorites to destroy us. Where can we go? Our brothers have made our hearts melt in fear. They say the people are stronger and taller than we are. The cities are large with walls up to the sky. We even saw the Anakites there. You see, they're grumbling because they, they know that when they go here, there's going to be, it's going to be tough. Following God into this new land is going to present challenges. It's going to be tough. Then I said to you, verse 29, do not be terrified. Do not be afraid of them. The Lord your God who is going before you will fight for you as he did for you in Egypt before your very eyes and in the wilderness. There you saw how the Lord your God carried you as a father carries his son. All the way you went until you reached this place. In spite of this, you did not trust your God, who went ahead of you on your journey in fire by night and a cloud by day to search out places for you to camp and to show you the way you should go. So here's Israel grumbling and arguing because they've forgotten what God has done from, for them. They've, he's taken them out of slavery in Egypt. And now they see in front of them a new challenge that life is going to be tough if we keep continuing to follow God. And they turn against God. They say, I'm af we're afraid. God has, God has he's done this on purpose. He's going to ruin us. He's going to kill us all. Grumbling and arguing is a distrust of God and a failure to fear God that comes from forgetting what God has done for us in Jesus. David in, Psalm, in the book of Psalms often brings, sounds like he's grumbling and arguing, doesn't he? He's like, oh God, like all of this thing, these bad things are happening to my life. Grumbling and arguing is not saying you can't come to God and say, look, God, this is really tough, this is really hard, and I don't understand why I'm going through this. That's not grumbling and arguing. Grumbling and arguing is to say, God, you're out to get me. 
I don't trust you. I don't care what you did for me before. I don't care what Jesus did for me. That means nothing because my present situation is tough and I'm going to forget everything that you have done for me. That's real grumbling. That, that's the grumbling and arguing that Paul is talking about. He's not saying you can't be honest before God. He's saying you can't do that while forgetting about what Jesus has done for you. If you're not a Christian and you're sitting here at church today, then um, here is a God, um, the God of the universe. He's all-powerful. He's all-knowing. He made you. He knows everything about you. and He knows what you're going through. And he says to you today, I am the Lord your God, and I'm going to go before you. I'm going to fight for you. I'm going to uh, make your path straight. I'm going to carry you like a father carries his son. And I don't know what you might know, think you know about God or you've heard about God or Christianity. But God is not this, you know, police officer in the sky waiting for you to slip up to give you a ticket. He's not a puppet master who treats this world and you as his toys and he doesn't care what you go through. It's like God says, as a father carries his son, God made you, he knows you, he holds you close. And I want you to invite, and I want to invite you to put your trust in in God. Because this is what he promises to do for you. And for those of us who do consider ourselves to be Christians and to be followers of God, let me encourage you as you hold on to God's commands, as you uh, try to be salt and light in your family and in your workplace, as you have these conversations with people you know are living in sin, as you have these conversations with yourself, as you try to figure out what it what it looks like for you to be a Christian and to honour God. God says, I'm going to go before you. I'm going to fight for you. I'm going to work in you. Remember that Jesus fought for you. Jesus died for you. He was obedient even to the cross. And he's going to carry you all the way so that everything you go through is not in vain. Rejoice and remember what God has done for you this week in Jesus. I'm going to end by looking at two people. And uh, for some reason, the slides aren't on the thing. Um, I might have, must, have made a, I must have uploaded the wrong file. But um, we're going to look at two examples. Two examples of two Christians. Um, and this is what we're going to end with. And these two Christians, according to Paul, mirror in some way the example of Jesus and sort of what we should be trying to be like. The first example is this guy called Timothy. Um, Verse 19 down to 22. If it's not on the screen, you can just listen to me. He talks about Timothy and he says this, and you can tell he really loves Timothy. I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you soon that I also may be cheered when I receive news about you. I have no one else like him. It's an amazing thing to say. I have no one else like him who will show genuine concern for your welfare. Everyone looks out for their own interests, not those of Jesus Christ. But you know that Timothy has proved himself because as a son with his father, he has served with me in the work of the gospel. Now Paul says there's no one like Timothy (laughs) Because he looks out, he's genuinely concerned about your welfare and everyone looks out for their own interests to make their life easier and better. But Timothy looks out for the interests of Jesus. And I want us to see a parallel between Timothy and between Jesus. In verse 20, uh, in verse 3, sorry, remember? Remember? What was the command? Do nothing out of selfish ambition, vain conceit. Value others above yourselves. Don't look to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. That's what Timothy is doing. So Paul's saying, hey, is it tough being a Christian? Is it tough following Jesus? I know, 
God is working in you, and he's an example of what God can do. Look at Timothy. If you think that you can never become someone who is taking on the mindset of Christ, who is valuing others and looking to others' interests, and you think, no, that's not me, Paul's saying, why not? God is working in you. Look at Timothy. The second example is Epaphroditus. Um, Epaphroditus, he nearly died. He nearly died. Uh, he was really sick. And this is what Paul has to say about him. Verse 29 and 30. Yeah. So then welcome Epaphroditus in the Lord with great joy and honour people like him because he almost died for the work of Christ. He risked his life to make up for the help you yourselves could not give him. Epaphroditus was from this church, this Philippian church, and he came to Paul while Paul was in prison. And Paul's saying, this guy nearly died to help me. This guy nearly died because he was doing something that you couldn't do. And once again, there's a parallel here, isn't there? with what Jesus has done. Verse 8, being found in appearance as a man, Jesus humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on the cross. So once again, Paul is saying, you think, I know you think it's going to be really tough, and it is, to give your life for someone else, to give your life for Jesus. But God is working in you. Look at Epaphroditus. He died, he almost died to do the things that you couldn't do because you were physically not there. He nearly died for Jesus and for me. God can and does and is working in you right now to make you like Jesus and to fulfill his good purpose. And I want to encourage you that when you find it tough, don't grumble, don't argue, Come to God to remember what he has done for you in Jesus and to remember God is working in you every single moment in your heart, in your actions to fulfill his good purpose. And I want that to be your strength and your courage. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word and we thank you that Jesus was the example of obedience and humility and and caring for the other more than himself. And yet we also see that Timothy and Epaphroditus was doing this. Lord, thank you that you're working in each one of us to work out our salvation with fear and trembling. And you're molding us into this very example. Help us to be encouraged. Help us to gain strength. To face every single day because you are working in us. We thank you and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.